as we left the last session incomplete and i felt that we need to really discuss uh, these five essential skills in depth and we planned it that we'll do it today before we start the next topic so we'll first cover the uh, five essential skills that i think each one of us should you know have a good uh, control on and also keep in keep in handy in your day to day interaction and then we'll move on to the third topic and that is designing a successful program we are going to talk about that so uh, uh, you remember what we discussed in the last session about the five essential skills do you remember the topic first essential yes. skill yeah rapper rapper building rapport yes absolutely and we all did an activity on building rapport i sent all of you to break out room so uh, uh, did that open uh, our mind to the idea that building rapport is not difficult it is not dependent on time it is more of a mindset or uh, our intention to do it a any any questions on that okay oh. great great so moving further the second skill that i want you to keep in mind is attentive listening so normally we all think that i am very attentive and very careful in listening and you saw that activity that we did in the session 2 where we you know exchange the information with couple of hands and we saw the whole information got distorted so i think that should be like more like an eye opening experience for us that we think we can communicate well but actually honestly it is not true it is not uh, correct lot of assumptions lot of you know cognitive uh, processes interfere with the attentive listening so we'll do a small activity today i want uh, to see everybody i can see only nine of you can i uh, can i have everybody have their camera on so that i know who all are there because we are, we are going to do a small activity mm. so whose camera is not on yeah yeah thank you okay so uh you are 10 of you right now uh i will send five of you to the waiting room but before i send you uh there's a task that you have to do before you you know when you are in the waiting room for couple of uh seconds or minutes you can say so i'm sure each one of you have had some interesting experience while handling your patients where you felt or oh, you did an extremely you know uh excellent work extremely good work your patient was really happy and satisfied with the way you dealt with the situation and they were thankful and grateful for your thing so i want you to just take couple of uh, minutes and think about one incident that you would like to share so i am sending uh, uh five of you outside i mean in the waiting area and i'll be bringing you back and i'm not choosing anybody but it's just the number that name that is coming up so uh, uh pile i'm sending you to the waiting area uh okay one second uh, one second yeah okay mm -hmm. so pile i'm sending you to the waiting room uh then uh dr amrit i'm sending you to the waiting room uh, i'm sending dr priya also to the waiting room and then uh dr deepika i'm sending you to the waiting room so i have sent five people and i have to send one more person so mamta i'm sending you also to the uh, waiting room okay and i'll be calling you one by one okay how come there are six people now i sent five uh okay aditi has also joined so let her come in so dr sukundan i will explain you the activity and then i will be sending you to the waiting room mm -hmm. so the activity is that during your interaction with your patients 
I'm sure there must have been a situation where your handling of your patient was very, you know, um, gratifying. And your patient was very happy and very satisfied with you. So try to recollect that one situation. And then I will be asking you to share that story with, with your uh, you know, a partner to whomever you are, I assign you. So I'm sending you to the uh, waiting room to sit and quietly think for a couple of seconds, and then I'll bring you back. One second. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. So there are six people in the waiting room, and I have six people here in the main area. Now the task is, I'm going to bring them back and put in the breakout room with each one of you. You will have one partner. As you heard the task, they are going to share a interesting story with all of you. But, and, and of course, like they would like to share with all uh, interest and zeal to all of you. But you as a listener, will have to not listen to this story. How can you show that I'm not listening? What else can you do to show that you are not listening? Not making eye contact, looking somewhere else, doing something else. Okay. Then Pick what else? Being, uh, being, being silent. Being silent. Do something. Okay, not being, nodding. Not saying, mm -hmm. what? Not nodding, no. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then picking up the phone and doing something on the phone. Uh huh. Picking up something and doing like pick the phone and doing something. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, uh, showing active uh, signs of disinterest, like uh, yawning or you know holding the phone or something. So maybe you could even start talking to your family member in between. Yeah. Get me a glass of water. What are you doing? Why can't you listen to me? I mean, you have to actually actively demonstrate that you are not listening. Is that okay? okay. So okay. I'm going to create a breakout room and I'm going to send, uh, you know, each one of you with the with your partner. And the total activity should not take more than uh, two to three minutes. And then you come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to take all of them. No, ma'am, there's yeah. a question. Please, I joined ahead. late. So okay. I have joined a bit late. So can you tell, okay. can you tell me some what? Wonderful. So Aditi, the activity is that I have put six people in the waiting room and I have asked them to, you know, recollect any one incident where they, they their patient was very happy with their way of handling the situation. And they really want to share that story with, with, with all of you, like with, uh, with your partner. So uh, what we want to, you know, learn or see is somebody has a story to tell and there is somebody who is not interested to listen. Okay. And we want to see what you feel. What you feel. Okay. Is this task clear? So I'm admitting all of them and then I'll create the outro. Dr. Hindu, can I say something? Now we have already started. They're already there. We have a demo. So if you want to say something, message me on my personal window. If it's something that you really wish to okay. share with. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, welcome back friends. I'm going to now put you in a breakout room with one partner each. And uh, those who were in the waiting room, I'm sure now you are ready with this story that you want to share, story or any incident that happened uh, that you want to share with your partner. And uh, uh, how much time do you think you would need to Share your story. About a minute? Yeah. A minute or two minutes. Yeah. 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 Should be good enough. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm creating breakout room and I would be putting you in the breakout room and total time, I think uh, one minute should be okay. I mean, uh, as you said, uh, total a minute. And uh, uh, after that, we come back to the main area and then we'll have a discussion. I mean, I would want you to share your experience of the storytelling. Okay, so I'm creating the breakout room. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
so dr neha is saying last time activity we could not hear each other see if yeah. everyone able to hear then probably the problem is with your network i'm really sorry then you will have to resolve this i mean if you even if you have to buy a you know dongle for specifically your program that is something you'll have to really you know work on because if network is a problem then i'm i'm really sorry i can't do anything that's not in my control i hope you understand yeah okay so i'm going to create the rooms and i'm going to uh, send uh, some of you yeah so room 1 uh, i assign okay Uh, two. It will take a little while because normally, uh, mm -hmm. so you have to uh, you'll have to see that you are not with the person you were already in the main room. It is somebody who has a story to share. Only then you will be able to you know. Uh, okay, there we go, and. Dr. Priya, you were in the main room with me. You were in the waiting room. Yeah, you were in the waiting room. Yes, I am. So, Dr. Santoshi, you have two logged in, uh, you know, devices. So you have to, uh, you know, uh, take out one. You have to actually. Actually, ma'am, uh, with my laptop, I'm having issues in connecting. So I have simultaneously I've connected with mobile. So let me go off with the laptop. I'll continue with mobile then. uh i i don't mind as long as we are able to manage and there is no echo my only concern is about echo okay 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 yeah done okay so uh dr deepika you were there in the main room please unmute and tell i was in the waiting room doctor you were in the waiting room okay so and i think i have an issue with my video so can i leave and exit and then join back because my video is not showing but it's still on so i'm not sure what's the issue oh, so when okay. can i exit exactly. and come back so that's dr amrit or who is that i'm not able to see your name okay dr deepika uh mm, okay if that's the case so i'm just uh, uh, making sure that you are with a partner who was not in the same room so aditi you were in the main area and dr kundan was in the waiting am i right Yeah, I was with you. I okay. was not in the waiting area. Okay, so you are partners. Uh, admin, admin, doctor, doctor Vandana, am I right? Doctor Vandana, I think it is better if you uh, you know have your proper name written. So, uh, doctor Vandana, you were there in the main room with me. No, I don't know whether. Doctor Vandana, are you there? Okay, Payal, you were in the. Uh, waiting room waiting yes yes okay okay dr amrit you were in the waiting room am i right yes i was in waiting yes yes and dr sneha you were here with me am i right yeah yeah okay. so uh, uh, dr priya you were in the uh, uh, you were in the waiting room am i right okay give me one second so i need to assign one more person so dr neha you were there with me here no okay and then uh, yes yeah who else is left deepika you were there with me or you were in the wait no you were in the waiting room and dr manisha you were here with me yes dr indo i was with you thank you okay and uh, okay and then one second who else is left okay so last is mamta you were uh, in the waiting room am i right okay and dr santoshi you were with me great so i have yes. assigned six uh, uh, breakout rooms and you have a partner who has a story to share and uh, please go ahead and have your discussion and then we come back in a minute time so you will have to join the uh, breakout room yeah
Dr. Kundan, you have to join. Yeah. Uh, Payal, I think Dr. Uh, Vandana is not, I can't see her. So, sorry, you'll have to really wait. Uh, Dr. Vandana? Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so ideally after the three or four sessions that I can able to make him stand on his toes and he has done a really a great job with me. So I understand that sometimes the patient, they don't have any physical challenges, but you Dr. have Ryan. to give some time. Yeah. Uh, so okay. keep still doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let everybody come back and then we start the discussion. Okay. So who all were sharing their story, please raise your virtual hand. Virtual hand. Do you know how to raise your virtual hand? Yes. Yeah, I took some time now. Yeah. So raise your virtual hand and so that I know 
who all were sharing their story. So I have three people who were doing it. Uh, Dr. Payal also was one of the person. Okay, so I want those who were sharing their story to share their experience. How did it go? What all you experienced? One by one. If I may ask Dr. Deepika to share. Experience of uh, the good communication or in the breakout room? Huh? Experience in the breakout room and not the person who was listening. The person who was telling the story. I want them to speak. How did they, uh, what did they feel? What did they see? And how did they feel? That's what I want them to share. So maybe, Deepika, you were there. You were sharing your story. Okay. So what happened in your case? Okay, so that was the activity, is it? I was kind of surprised on why Dr. Manisha was not being very <laughs> friendly with me. Fine, yeah. So she did her role very well. <laughs> she, she wasn't listening to me. She was uh, she was uh, completely uh, disoriented or even, I mean, I, I, I felt a little bad. Uh, you know, I didn't even want to continue telling her the story. And I, I took a pause. <laughs> And I felt that I should stop and maybe tell her that what she's doing is not right because she has to be on the listening side. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, apart from that, she was also speaking to someone else and then she was speaking to someone over phone. So I was thinking that is not the usual Dr. Manisha that I used to see in the meeting. So yeah, these were the few things that happened. Now I got to know. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Manisha. <laughs> and good acting, huh? No, so this this is what a, a person who doesn't listen. So there is a term for it, which is called that you are not listening. So act, I'm not. I was not uh, doing the active listening part. I was out of the listening. So, uh, I was Dr. ignoring. Kipika, that was the activity. Before we discuss further, I first want to listen to those who wish, to those who had to share a story, but they were not. Uh, able to do, how did you feel being there? Mamta? Yeah, uh, I feel very much distracted. Actually, I, I find uh, Dr. Santosh, she was like not able to listen to me, not able to connect me, first of all. And her expressions was also like quite you know, serious kind of. I was thinking what happened to Dr. Santoshi as if we were meeting very first time. And while talking, uh, she got some another call and in spite of her, me explaining very well, she asked me again, what was that? And I felt like, oh, is it okay? Then again, I explained it. There, were, uh, there was no proper connection between us. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your experience. Dr. Kundan, <laughs> what did yeah. you experience? Yeah, so I think Dr. Aditi played her part very well. And uh, let me tell you, even this is a role play, even I, at the back of the mind, I had that this might be a, a role play, but still I was offended. So I can very well imagine how the patient might be feeling. Because even if we are all here to learn and uh, the role plays are there, but still I was for 15-20 uh, seconds, I was really offended. I kept quiet. Then I realized that maybe it is a part of the activity. But I can now and uh, now realize what the patient might be uh, suffering or my patient might be feeling. And uh, that I really realize. Also, not only the patient, sometimes I do uh, feel the medical representatives also might be feeling the same, which who okay. might uh, you know deal some, not maybe as cordially as with the patient. But we uh, so that also other side of the story, I could realize that there is a, you know, uh, that how you feel. Very rightly often, said. Often, one minute of activity could open your mind to so many new learnings. One, that's the power of pedagogies. A lot of the time, MR used to come and I do the same thing with them. I know. Now I can feel how. I am not going into the. I am not going into the motive of why, what you do, and why you do. Of course, we will be discussing that at the appropriate time. But, and we are very selective in giving that behavior. It's not that with everybody we behave in the same manner. Suppose in the same moment, if your friend came in, you would be very different. But with some people, we take that relationship for granted. With juniors, with nurses, with, with uh, general duty staff, with, uh, with your 
medical representative, I think that's a very good example you gave Dr. Kundan because normally we don't value them. But honestly, don't they play a very big role in the way we function? But we kind of show them you are nothing in front of me. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Thank you. So Payal, what was your experience? So um, when uh, we started, you know, with the Neha ji, I was so excited to tell her about my story. And I kept it in a mind that it has to be only for the one minute. So I have to finish it off all the factors that, you know, she should listen. I thought it is a listening. So I have to make sure that she'll listen carefully about the each and everything I will tell. In between, she took a call. So the first time I just, I get like, what? I, I actually posed for her call to get over. And then I asked her, okay, this, we have to finish it in one minute. Are you listening here? <laughs> and then uh, even though she doing a lot of other stuff, and then I started realizing that, you know, I started forgetting the main point, which I have to deliver to her. So yes. it, it does. I think that when you do that way, the patient will forget what, whatever the most important thing they have to tell you about them. Fire, so such then a the distraction point yeah. you have brought up, do you know? Such a vital point you have brought up. One, patients are not trained how to narrate their story. They are there, yeah. they come prepare with the list. In Western world, patients are trained, you know, how to advocate mm. for yourself or how to go with the question, list of questions. And doctors can't yeah. say, hey, you, you can't have a list of questions. In India, patients are, don't even know that they can have a list of questions. And you have pointed right. such an important point that the way we behave, that actually ends them leaving in confusion mm. and utter rejection. And a feeling that the doctor is not concerned about my, uh, you know, symptoms. Yeah. No, simple things like, you know, watering of eye or yeah. blurring of vision, which is, which for ophthalmologists, such a small yes. thing yeah. that you we consider, ye to antibiotic dialogue it ho jayega. Ye, uh, lubricant dialogue it ho jayega. But a mm. person who is suffering with this, they, they're really affected majorly with these small things. I think hmm. that's a very, very important point that you have brought up, Pyle. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, I think we have Dr. Amrit and Dr. Priya. I want both of you to share your experience because there is a lot to learn from your experience. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Amrit, yeah? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh -huh. Actually, uh, as you said, choose something to talk about which you feel very dearly about, right? So mm. out of my 35 years of practice, I actually had to look for something which was very, very moving and important for me. And mm. Dr. Sneha was totally compassionless and no connection, totally distracted when she was listening to me. And at one point, point, I just did not feel like going ahead and talking to her at all. She took a call in between and uh, initially also there was some problem with the sound and everything. So uh, I was feeling that even after knowing so much, being around so many people, communicating with thousands of people for so many years, I felt so dejected in a minute. So mm -hmm. how would the person who is talking to me be feeling? That person already has so much baggage, so much problem, so much of a history of a disease and suffering. Then what is going to happen to that person? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of time, there is a patient's attendant who is observing this whole transaction. That's and if true. a patient is elderly, usually it is a grandson, granddaughter, or young or daughter or son. They feel that we are being disrespectful to the patient. So they feel hurt that my relative has been disrespected. Absolutely. They keep, and they keep that you know grudge within them. And given a chance, they take out that grudge by talking ill about us or maybe misbehaving with us. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that. And also, any patient who is coming to you, especially for government setup, let me tell you, patients sometimes wait for two to three hours to reach you. And they get just two to three minutes of yours. And if you don't give them any attention or if you don't listen to them, and if you appear distracted, and as you said, compassionless. Honestly, I think that's a very right term that you used. A lot of time, our facial expressions show that we are compassionless. It gives a wrong you know, impression to the patient, but they do interpret it like this. So imagine the kind of uh, you know, uh, image that we will have in their eyes. 
in the patient's life. Thank you, Dr. Amrit, for bringing that very nice. Thank you. Dr. Priya, would you like to share your experience? No. Actually, uh, I had uh, suddenly my laptop had logged off. So mm -hmm. the minute, the few, that one minute I was actually offline. So I couldn't share an experience. But okay. yeah, hearing, I, I would have gone through the same if someone wouldn't have heard me out. Okay. Absolutely. So I'm sure this small activity must have opened to your mind to one skill. One skill that you should always, always have and that is prompt attention and attentive listening. When I'm talking to you and if I don't respond to you or when I don't allow you to speak or when I don't acknowledge your comment, how do you feel? Exactly this is what your patients feel or your staff feels when you don't talk to them properly or when you don't listen to them. So it's very important to not only listen, but also give prompt attention. A lot of time, you know, in your young age, like when you were a student, you must have been to your consultant's office or head of the department's office. You are waiting outside at the gate with your, you know, uh, your master's uh, thesis or for any other project activity. You are very much in the visual field of your faculty, but you are not called in. Your standing there is not acknowledged. You are not asked to come in and sit and wait. I'm sure you must have experienced the same thing that you did just now. So prompt attention. If you are busy, it's perfectly all right. You can say, can you please wait for two minutes? Let me finish with the work that I have at hand. I'll call you in. Or saying that I'm sorry, I will not be able to attend you today. For example, if it is a medical representative, you make them wait and then you, you say, no, I have to go for a meeting. And they, they have to know. They waited for you know, three, four hours and then they have to go back without meeting you. Or if you say, I'm sorry, I will not be able to meet you today. Can we, can we plan it on some other day? So the idea is not only paying attention, but also respecting the presence of the person. So let me quickly share a couple of slides around it that I want you to know. Uh, we talked about uh, building rapport, and I think we have clarity about building rapport, that how important it is to you know, build rapport with your patient. And the second skill that I talked about is, you know, attentive listening and we we all have had a you know opportunity to experience personally any 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 experience those who are listening who want to share maybe one of you if i if i may just anything very uh, interesting or very uh, something that will help us learn something about listening uh, my experience with Dr. Amrita was uh, that uh, I felt while listening that I, I am fully present, though I was acting that, you know, uh, I was not giving her uh, proper attention, not, not nodding or, you know, saying mm, and encouraging her. I yeah. felt that I was actually listening to her quite well and I'm, I'm remembering the entire thing. But now when I think of it, because that was not, that is not the usual way I usually participate in communication, I feel the story is foggy now. At that point, I was feeling that I am listening actually very well. But mm -hmm. now I feel that, you know, most of the things, I don't know if I have listened well. I don't uh, remember it. So exactly. even our own uh, decision making and diagnosis will get affected when we are not actively listening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, Dr. Sneha. I think that was a very important point. So this we have discussed. So I'm not spending time on this. We are going moving to the next slide and that is prompt attention. We did an activity. So as I always say, it's not only really important to, you know, uh, listen attentively, but you also should be able to demonstrate that I'm listening to you because that encourages the person to narrate further, talk further. So when a person is talking, it is very important to look at the person, face the person, especially in most of the hospitals. Now we have a laptop or a PC on one side, patient on the other side. So if you are looking at the patient, then you have to you know, stop typing. And if you're looking at the computer, then you have to stop looking. So you really have to strike a balance between facing the person, making an adequate eye contact. And even when you're typing on the computer or on the iPad, you have to let the patient know that I am simultaneously noting down the key points. Is it okay with you? 
if they know it is a rhetorical question the answer will be yes it's all right but then they will feel one that okay the doctor is not doing some personal work she is typing my information and second they have a choice to say yes and no both for example if they really want you to you know pay attention then probably they'll say any doctor do minute pehle meri baat sun lijiye fir aap enter kar lijiye so that means that's the way you have to strike a balance smile if everything is fine there is no serious condition then smiling will be appropriate that will calm down people and make them comfortable avoid multitasking because when you are multitasking patients feel that we are not giving them 100% of attention leaning forward helps to communicate that i am listening to you if you nod the person gets an idea you are not only listening but understanding and agreeing with them preferably when they are talking avoid interrupting even if it is not making much sense you can note down and then maybe later on you can you know uh, ask if case if that's not clear to you or if you want further information about it now third is third skill two skills we have talked about third skill that i want you to keep in your pocket always is positive and helpful attitude so if i may ask you why is it important to have a positive and a Uh, you know a uh, helpful attitude can somebody answer maybe one person only one person i can allow because we can't uh, have long discussion i what i feel ma'am is being in the medical profession and healthcare professionals mm -hmm. uh, being having positive attitude and giving the person hope is the best medicine that we can always give along with the pharmaceutical medical medicine that we need wonderful thank you for summing that up so so okay there is no doubt about it positive attitude is very important because patient should feel you know that they are wanted they are accepted how will you demonstrate it if somebody else would like to answer how will you demonstrate that you have a positive attitude towards by them? giving them uh, attention madam and uh, uh, making them feel that they are listening and they care about what they saying okay wonderful that's one good idea any other way that you can you can communicate using words like you know positive words or you know whenever we try to give them the recovery options or treatment options mm -hmm. the choice of words should be more on a positive note and more of empathetic so that will be easier to uh, make them understand wonderful wonderful so i always say positive attitude first of all towards your own profession then towards your organization towards patients towards society on the whole is very important because anywhere if there is negativity trust me that will get reflected in your conversation that will get reflected in your body language so i normally narrate a very interesting story uh, there was a building being made and there were laborers who were you know doing the labor work so somebody who was passing by that uh, site asked the first laborer what are you doing he said i'm making an earning because you know i'll work for the whole day in the evening i'll get some money and i'll can can get some food for my kids and that's my livelihood so a lot of us work with this attitude that what i'm doing is more to do with my livelihood there's nothing wrong in that i'm not saying that it's wrong it's very important part of our responsibility that we have to earn livelihood for our family so this fellow goes to the second laborer and asks him what are you doing he was little frustrated irritated in a very you know irritated tone he says are you blind can't you see i am breaking stones can't you see i am doing labor so you will see and you will come across lot of people in your own system whenever you go to them with any question or query or request for help they'll always be frustrated and unhappy they'll never promptly come up with solution or help or support they'll always find fault with system with you with everybody around so you can well imagine what their attitude must be for their work or their responsibility or people around them now this fellow goes to another labor the third one and asks him what are you doing so he takes this person to one side and there's a huge building map put on the you know two poles and he says this is a huge temple coming up here and i'm building that temple one job 
three people doing with three different mindsets. So the thoughts and feelings you create about your job, about your responsibility, decides the quality of your work, the way you function, and how much you enjoy your work, how much you like your work. So third thing that I want always, you know, in your pocket is positive attitude towards not only your work, towards yourself, towards your organization, towards people you meet, towards patients, because that's what is going to decide the quality of your interaction. One simple rule, your willingness to engage in conversation is a sign of positive attitude. If you are happy to attend your patient, if you are happy to clarify things, if you are happy to answer their question, that shows that you really value your work. You don't have to be a doctor or a nurse or a, you know, a very highly placed person. Even if you are a security guard, but if you do your job well, if you talk to your patients nicely, if you explain them well, job well done. And I always link this with karma. I don't know how many of you trust this philosophy of karma. I feel people working in healthcare, they don't need to go to temple or mosque or, or church or anywhere, honestly. This is your karam bhumi. You, you do good deeds, you get blessings. You don't need to go to temple because you blessings would come to you automatically. But provided you value your work, provided you see your work in that light. But if you think that that's boring, that's burden, that's meaningless, then you don't get that. That's the, that's the way I look at the work we all do in healthcare. Fourth point that I want to tell you, which is very important, skill that will help you have wonderful relationship with your patients, their family members, and your team members, is treat not only your patients, but also your coworkers with respect and dignity. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, for bringing that up. It's very important to remember, especially I'm saying this for doctors. A lot of time, we have this feeling that I'm the one who is running the show. Yes, you are leading the show. There's no doubt about it. But let me tell you, each member of your team has a role to play. And a small part missing can land up into an air crash. I was watching a you know, series on air crash. So one of the air crash happened because of one small, you know, nut bolt missing in the body of the, uh, you know, plane. That's the importance of every member. So you are doctor or you're a nurse or you're an administrator. Be grat grateful to almighty to have been given that position. But treat everybody with respect because they are human being first and then whatever they are. Plus, your patients also come from, you know, good background, educated, well-off, well-placed. So because we are treating them, we can't take them for granted or ill-treat them or be disrespectful to them. A lot of time mistake that we do is we are very nice and polite with people who are educated and well-placed. But sometimes our behavior with people who are uneducated or economically weaker section or from rural background our behavior alters. This is sometimes, you know, it happens unknowingly also. So very carefully, very mindfully, we have to let this not happen. So irrespective of their age, caste, creed, socioeconomic status, educational status, we have to treat patients with respect and dignity. A lot of time, patients will not agree with your opinion. Patient may not agree for surgery. Patient may not agree for getting admitted. In spite of that, you have to respect their opinion and say, this is what I think would be good for you. But you make your own choice because that's patient's right to decide about their life and their treatment. So treat the patient with respect and dignity. I think most of the aggressive reactions can be looked after if you can manage that. And then fifth point that I want you to go back with is empathy. I think healthcare without empathy is will 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 fail because the primary purpose of anybody coming to healthcare is to alleviate pain, alleviate suffering. Of course, now we are looking at healthcare as a profession, as an industry, as a, as a you know, revenue generating, you know, corporate. 
But honestly, that was not the purpose why healthcare was established. So it's very important to look at things from the patient's point of view. Look at their you know, suffering and see how you can alleviate their suffering. So usually we experience four emotions in any situation. Let me quickly you know, give you an idea because I remember uh, Payal had questioned uh, empathy and sympathy. So I think we should have clarity on it. What is the difference between the two? We all experience four kinds of emotions. Anybody knows about those four emotions? Anybody who has an idea? What are the four different emotions? Anger, emotions? happiness. Sadness. No. Sadness, Anger. happiness. Primary sorry. emotions. No, no, they are emotions. I'm sorry. They're, they're, uh, what I want to say in terms of variation in uh, empathy, variation in empathy, the way you look at the situation. Indifferent. Okay. Indifferent, okay. Sim apathy, sympathy. what is apathy? Apathy, okay. Sympathy, very sympathy, good. Sympathy, empathy. Uh -huh. Very good. You are now on the right line. Empathy, sympathy, and, and apathy, you said. One more term. Antipathy. Antipathy, excellent. Thank you, Dr. Amri. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm glad that you all knew this. See, usually when a patient comes with pain and we don't attend them promptly, they get a feeling that we are not concerned or affected by their pain. Sometimes we make them wait. Bad job. Emergency me patient aya. I'm nurse on duty and I tell the patient, Betty wait kariya abhi doctor aare. I can see the patient is in pain. I can see the patient is really, you know, not able to stand. Sometimes they are in queue and they are not able to stand. And I say, this is apathy. When I'm not understanding the patient's you know, challenges and I'm not responding to them in spite of being a healthcare provider. Second is, this person comes and argues with me and says, Aadha ghanta ho gaya, hai pe wait karte hai. Aap bhi nahi dekh rahe, aap kisi doctor ko nahi bila rahe, kya hospital aapka? Bekaar hai hospital aapka. I don't say anything to that patient, but in the heart of my heart, I say, Tujhe aur pandra minute nahi dekhenge. Chinta mat kar. Because you talked rudely with me and you insulted me in front of others, I will not attend to you for another 10 minutes. Tujhe to bilkul nahi dekhoongi. Baakir sabko dekhoongi, tujhe nahi dekhoongi. This is antipathy. 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 The third emotion that we all experience is a mother comes with a child child is unwell, mother is literally in tears. Seeing her cry, I feel like crying and I start crying. That is sympathy. So honestly, these three emotions are inappropriate for healthcare providers. The correct emotional response to this situation is empathy, where you are able to look at things from the patient's point of view. You don't get carried with that patient. But in your own place, you try to think, how can I reduce the suffering of this patient? How can I make this patient comfortable? How can I communicate that we shall do our best to see whatever best can be done is done on time? So empathy is one emotion that's very empowering, very, 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 you know, uh, relieving and very very, uh, you know, energy booster. So empathy is not draining. Empathy is not taking away your energy. Empathy gives you a lot of power and satisfaction because you know you can do something. You know you can change the situation. You know you can relieve your patient of suffering and pain. And once you do it, I think that's one good job done you know, in your place. So empathy is something that each and every healthcare provider should be able to not only learn, Practice, but demonstrate. So when you want to demonstrate or express empathy, it's not just verbally saying, oh, I understand it must be really painful. No, that's just a lip service. That doesn't make much of difference. So expressing empathy is, first of all, listen to them. Validate their feeling. Whatever support or care you can provide, please do that. Show compassion in your way of handling the situation. Show understanding if they need a place to sit or if you think they... they they need to, you know, be attended at promptly or they need to be given some additional service or help. Be understanding. Take it forward. Be patient and non-judgmental because a lot of times their behavior is not appropriate. They are 
rude or aggressive and we get affected by it and we start reacting in reality. But very honestly, we really need to be non-judgmental and be more calm in that situation. And we need to mindfully treat them with respect and dignity, irrespective of their behavior. So a lot of times, for example, if I can share my personal experience with you, my father, who uh, unfortunately is no more now, but around 15, 20 years ago, he got his bypass surgery done in one of the very premier hospitals of Delhi. And I remember everything was going well. Then I left the hospital for a day or two. I had to visit somebody on an urgent basis. And on my way back, I received the call that, uh, you know, your, your father is having ICU psychosis and we are shifting him to, you know, a side room. I said, that's perfectly all right. It's understandable. But unfortunately, when I went to the ICU, I saw it personally that he was having symptoms of ICU psychosis, which is a very normal process and people are put in hospital with so many tubings and machinery around. To my surprise, the doctors and nurses were literally ridiculing for making fun of his behavior or his, you know, his whatever he was saying or doing. I think that was not called for. If you are a professional and if you know hospital psychosis is one of the possibilities in, 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 in patients with the, with the long stay in ICU, you need to be more you know, neutral and more uh, professional in your approach when you're dealing with such situation. I'm sure from your life, you will have a lot of you know, incidents that you can bring up here. But the idea that I want to give you is please look at situations from their point of view. Don't judge their behavior or what they are saying. Understand that when you are in pain, when you are suffering, you are in need of help, you get agitated, you become aggressive. That's not something that they thought and they came with, but they, 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 they suddenly that's a reaction to the situation. Uh, yes, Dr. Uh, Vandana, you want to say something. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Uh, here, uh, this is a very good uh, point that you are talking about, about uh, hospital psychosis as such. So, uh, being an ophthalmologist, we uh, usually deal with people who are little elderly. And there are many people who are uh, many patients who have, uh, you know, not had any uh, uh, health issues all their life. And maybe, you know, at the age of 60, 65, 70, the, for the first time, they are going for cataract surgery. And that is the first time they go come to the hospital. And they're, I mean, they're blessed with good health because they don't have to visit the hospital and it's really very nice. But when they come for the cataract surgery, it's like immediately we have to tell them that, yes, now this is only the surgery is the only option. They don't have any other option of having glasses or uh, medicines or something like that. And they are yeah. terribly, uh, you know, upset that, uh, and they, the uh, relatives tell us that we will come to show you the reports, we will do everything, but we will bring her only as minimum as possible to the hospital and, you know, make sure that, you know, the patient is totally, she's very scared. She isn't not even ready to come here to check her eyes. But then, you know, in such a situation, I mean, this is very good that if you could explain to us um, how to deal with such situation. So I think one is patients usually are scared of something, either the OT or the medicines or the injection. So rather than starting to explain whatever you think will help the patient, ask the patient what is your concern? The moment you will ask, what is your concern? They'll tell you, I injection se bahut dar lagta hai. Mujhe OT ki smell achhi nahi lagti hai. Mujhe machinery dekkar ghabraat ho jati hai. Now you know what their concern is. Address it. If they say ki OT ki smell achhi nahi lagti, so you can tell them ki aap, aap, main aapko apne staff ke saath bhej ki ho, ek bari dekh kar aiye. Uh, I can introduce you to so many patients whom we operate every day basis. I still remember uh, Dr. Aparna. Actually, my husband is an, also an ophthalmologist. So I remember, I remember uh, a patient, uh, a distant relative of mine. She went to three, four places for surgery and right on the OT table, she will get up and come back. She will not get this surgery done. Then she came to our clinic. She came to my husband. And my husband told me that she has been to these two, three places. And right at the time of surgery, she'll get up from the OT table and run away and she will not get this surgery. I said, don't worry. I'll manage it. I just spoke to the patient. 
made her comfortable, addressed her concern, tried to calm her down and showed her that we all are going to be around you. And whatever concerns you have, you can ask me. So she did come up with these concerns. When I explained to her, talked to her, she got this such data. I think that's the power of communication and counseling. That's the power of communication and counseling. Thank you for bringing that up. I can see two hands, Dr. Kundan and Dr. And Mamta. Dr. Kundan, yes, please. You wish to say something. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is a very important topic of empathy. Mm -hmm. Since you have brought it up, I'll just add a few uh, things of my own personal experience. I always mm -hmm. feel that uh, in, uh, especially in critical care units, when whenever there is a death, so uh, uh, for us or for the uh, consultant or the doctor nurses, it might be just another person. But for the relative, his, his father or mother, 40, 50 years, he has been with that person and all the emotions running in the mind. And all of a sudden, he sees around that doctors, nurses are cracking jokes. They are smiling. They are happy. They are maybe... So I think maybe they are not making fun of the patient in particular. But this also, uh, you know, it feels really... At least patient, I always feel at least when a person dies, you don't see mortality very often in ICUs, at least one or two deaths in a in a day, okay, on the average or three. So at least for those few uh, minutes or hours, I think there can be some um, uh, grief uh, procedures followed by at least SOPs by the doctors, nurses, at least for that period. Once the body shift out, shifted out, maybe, I'm not saying everybody should be grim and serious in ICU, but at least... At least when the person is, at, uh, you know, has uh, has died and relatives are there saying or last saying, so I think that uh, is what I always feel that uh, that can be handled very well, and that is the cause of many times uh, violence or litigation. Also, people feel that Absolutely. my father has father has died, and these people don't care, you know, don't have don't feel anything about it, even if, even if it's their routine work, even if it's their routine. Uh, thing, but I think that feeling I think I, I could sense in many patients' relatives and many patients. I told think you have brought up an excellent point, Dr. Kundan. I think that's very, very important that when the patient is about to die or has just died, you got to understand what their family must be thinking or feeling. You don't have to sit and cry with them, but at least maintain that composure where you sound or you appear professional and dignified. I remember when we were kids. Our parents did not allow us to switch on TV or radio when we had a death in the neighborhood. I still remember this. My mother used to say, TV ni chalega aaj. Kyo? Ke ghar mein death hoye. Achha nahi lagta. That means for those few minutes or hours, if you can maintain that composure, people feel that you are with them in their pain. So I'm not asking you to sit and start crying with them. I remember I was taking a session at one of the hospitals and head of the department pediatrics shared his experience. He said one child whom we knew is going to die because he had, you know, uh, stage four cancer. They, they were trying to intubate the child in the last, you know, couple of hours. They were not able to do because it's, a, it's not easy to intubate a small child. So they called somebody from the anesthesia department to do it. So anesthetist, when that person came in, now, this, uh, there, there were a lot of people around that because they were concerned that the child is really unwell and might, you know, die. So, in a very rude tone, he literally shouted at the patients, you know, relatives. That, that behavior, I mean, people just quietly moved out. He did the intubation and then unfortunately, they lost the child. <coughs> The very next day, the very next day, those relatives came in and spoke to this pediatrician with whom they had very good relationship, very good rapport. He said, Doctor, what doctor was the doctor who came to the child's face? He asked, why was it? He said, he was very you know, uh, rude and very wrong in his conduct. Doesn't he understand that a child was about to die how, what we must be going through. And he was so rude and, you know. So even if you have to send them out, simple saying, I will tell you that you will go out of the way. I will try to do my best for your child. That's all. That's all. So I agree with you, Dr. Kundan. That's a very important point you have brought up. Especially in the, and that is the reason for violence. That apathy, that antipathy, that, that is visible in our conduct. I'm sorry to say this is one of the most 
you know, uh, vital trigger, you can say, in uh, violence. We really need to sit and introspect and see how we can, you know, change this. And I've, I have got, you know, anecdotes. I, I mean, the, the discussion can go and or go on and on. I can see two hands more, but I have full one topic to cover. We have yet not started topic three. But just I want to bring it here. I have anecdotes, you know, where uh, people come up and say, Ki death hui hai. Or doctors aapas mein baat kare, khana kaha se mangwaayin, uski biryani mangwaayin, uski biryani bhoat achi hoti hai. Or they are giggling, or they are teasing each other, or they are showing something on the WhatsApp, or they are laughing, maybe joke or a picture, something that they are laughing about. To worst on that, sometimes they say that we have seen them shouting at the patient's attendant, diseased patient, not, no, not the patient, diseased family. Bahar ja ke roye, yaha aur bhi patient hai, bahar ja ke roye. I never thought that we have to teach this to our healthcare professionals. But I think it's time we bring that up. I wish I could take more questions. Mamta, if you have something very important to say, maybe as short as possible. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm gonna... I'll, skip, I'll skip here, ma'am. Uh, no problem because uh, many questions are going. Just one thing. Uh, now it is popping out in my mind. Uh, that what if a few doctors are... Uh, the people who are senior to us, if we feel that they are rude, they are not appropriate um, talk or something, how should we counterattack? Either we should directly tell them or we should keep quiet. What should be our uh, uh, response to such behavior? So, Mamta, that's a very important point that, uh, that you have brought up. And for that, as I said, I'm going to devote to one session. That is, how do you assert? So, assertion is, even if I'm talking to somebody senior, I can still put my, you know, uh, thoughts in a manner that does not sound offending or being disrespectful. But in a subtle manner, I'm able to communicate that this is not okay and how this can, you know, create problem. But definitely, that's a very good point. We could even take one role play on this. As you please remember to bring that up whenever we will have role play. We can bring that, take that up and we can, we can talk. So, Dr. Manisha, if you have any any point which is very short and crisp, you can bring up. Otherwise, we move on. Yeah, ma'am. I just wanted to say that, you no, know, because of the apathy or antipathic behavior, uh, patients get, uh, get violent. I had faced this situation. I controlled that situation. The patient went lama. And then they came just because of me to get operated in the organization where I worked. Mm. Yeah. So, no, it's very that yes. A lot of time when patient is going lama, we just take it. Okay, jane do. Ja hai, jane do. Sign karwao, chutti karo. And jate time bhi hum unko kya bol dete hai? Uh, aapki jimmedari pe le ja rahe ho. Mujhe, kal ko mujhe mat blame kariyega for the outcome. So, that is adding, you know, fuel to this situation. But I'm glad no, that I continued. I continued to be in contact with them, and I brought back the patient because uh, the only child interventionist was in our hospital, so that mm. the patient's uh, child can benefit from it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think that's wonderful. You see, uh, Doctor Santoshi, do you have a point to say? Because you have raised your hand, and I don't want to. Uh, Again, yes. yeah, yeah. As uh, Dr. Manas uh, uh, Lama cases, ma'am, like uh, we are talking about hospital settings. And as I belong to out of hospital setup where uh, we mostly deal with patients in ambulances when they're out of hospital scenario. And mm -hmm. many times it will really reverse here where uh, patients are kind of very aggressive mm -hmm. and uh, they are uh, taking uh, that uh, dominance over our paramedic team or doctor teams who are traveling with the patient in ambulance. Like Dr. Manisha said that many times Lama cases are there and mm -hmm. where uh, from hospital end, they you know, do not share any kind of summaries with us. And we have to take the patient uh, on patient risk, attenders risk. And uh, now they are completely dependent on us, on our team who is handling that case in ambulance. And uh, many times if the situation is like where the patient is about to die, where he dies en route mm -hmm. or um, so in that case they are a little bit aggressive and here how our paramedics needs to communicate with them or how to control that aggressive situation stressful situation which they are handling in a setup where they are on the road so and again not... uh, yeah again i would say Sir santoshi this can be taken up as one of the situation of role play 
but very quickly to answer your question so that you don't get the feeling that my question has not been answered. Subject knowledge plays a very big role. If your paramedics know their subject well, very quickly they can turn the table and give them that confidence that I know how to handle it. That's one. Second is whatever needs to be done should be done promptly and in a respectful manner. Do it and also tell them that this is what is being done and we will do whatever best needs to be done. Third is making effort to build rapport. The aggression gets fueled with only one thing. Please remember, this is for all of us. Aggression gets fueled with only one thing and that is aggression. If you do not respond with aggression, but you assert you can manage any amount of aggression. The problem is the moment patient party becomes aggressive, we become super aggressive or we are very annoyed or we are actually very unhappy and we want to, if not take revenge, but we become cold and we become you know, withdrawn. Again, these are different ways we handle the situation. We are going to do a small questionnaire that I'll be giving you and you will know your own handling style. How do you handle? You can use that tool for your staff and you will know what is their you know, handling management style. But if we learn how to handle people who are aggressive by staying calm, professional, confident, and firm, you can actually contain any situation of aggression. But I think through role play, when I give you a demo, uh, we will have a more better understanding of it. Is that okay, Dr. Santoshi? Yes, uh, that, that is what, madam. We need to have some out-of-hospital scenarios also. So that, uh, you, you bring that up and we will definitely, yeah. So there's a book uh, on non-violent communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Thank you, Sneha, for bringing that up. Uh, obviously, I'm not read, but that I'm sure there must be good learning. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, those who are interested, they can definitely read that book. Thank you. Thank you for that. So the last point, as I said, was about empathy. So five points that I have talked about, if you can keep them in your pocket, that's why I've summed everything into these five points. Remembering everything may not be possible, but if you remember these five points, let me tell you most of the situations you will be able to handle. The first one was, Building that. Rapo. Rapo. Building that. Second, uh, active listening and prompt attention. Prompt attention and attentive listening. Third, positive, positive attitude. And positive attitude. And Absolutely. Fourth, dignity. Uh, empathy. Respect and dignity. The patient and dignity. Ah, uh, respect. And number five is empathy. 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 So if you, and, and uh, uh, Santoshi, if you can bring up these five points and your team, you will be able to see a sea change in their behavior and also the response from the patient party. Yeah, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So moving further, uh, any, any questions about this? Because I want to quickly move to the second topic, uh, the next topic, topic three. Okay. So the, the, uh, the third topic that we need to discuss or we are going to discuss now is designing a uh, you know, impactful program. So if I may ask you, uh, okay, R-A-P-E-R, -E the mnemonic. Okay, thank you. Thank you for giving that wrapper. Wow, good. So R, R stands for? Rapo. Rapo building. Arre, wow. Ye to bahut badi ho gaya. Then uh -huh. A is, yeah. is your attitude? Attentive, is uh, active attentive listening. Attentive, attentive listening. listening. Okay, attentive wonderful. Listening. And P is for positive attitude. I have to note down. I have to note down because then this will help me in making my task easier. Okay, positive uh, attitude. Then next attitude. is at, okay. Then empathy. 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 Uh, and respect and respect. Respect. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Sneha, for bringing that up. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So moving further from here, as I said, we will be talking about. How do you go about uh, designing a program? So as of now, if I may ask you, uh, what are the broad steps that you, you know, have when you are designing a program? Write in your notebook first, and then I'll be quickly asking you to just read the caption, not the details, because we can't spend that much of time. But take two minutes and write the uh, steps that you normally, you know, take to design a program. In your notebook, you can write.
uh, ma'am a doubt is this about the process of getting the um, training or the content of the training so suppose if you are designing a program you have been asked to do a training for your healthcare professionals in your hospital so what all will you do step 1 step 2 step 3 okay overall designing okay. yeah okay done okay so maybe two people who have not spoken can take a you know opportunity to share what they have written those who have not done any talking okay yes aditi go ahead unmute your device and please uh, define the key desired outcome what do we want in the end mm -hmm. determine who will be the one who will be benefiting by the program we will making mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. analyze the data which we have gathered and gather the required data of required uh, information so gather the all the information then make the program so information is about the content you are talking content. or the content okay content. okay okay thank you this is uh, and that's all aditi that's all okay so uh, something that aditi has missed please raise your hand and answer anything aditi has missed that you think mamta is there any point that you think you she has missed yes ma'am first finding out the need of the program or demand of the program then frame the scope of the program then uh, after that uh framing the entire uh, program in a structured one point, one point. let others give their get give their input one point one point okay, okay. Yeah. thank you yes deepika what do you say you can yeah. raise your virtual hand everybody please raise your virtual hand so that i know you have a point to add something that they have not covered something that yeah. and, so uh, i would include uh, having a pre assessment and a post assessment whenever i plan a training Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Yes, Neha. What do you see? Uh, I wanted to say the same. Self-assessment uh, is the uh, what are the problem areas, okay. and then starting with why, and uh, ending with uh, what will you change once you go back, and then having what? a buddy system that uh, they keep uh, follow up also with one another. Okay. Thank you. One. Yeah. Yeah. What do you have to add? Go ahead, please. We. I. I think we should also assess the age group. of the audience that we would be addressing to to plan the presentation team or the activity that we'd be looking for Probably wonderful that means know your audience you know your audience that's going to help you excellent wonderful yes santoshi anything you wish to add uh, yes uh, like uh, the program planning as dr priya has said that uh, audience who is our target audience and what is the objective Okay. Uh, I think that if somebody has attention, this has to be covered in that particular duration. So duration also we should know. Duration and that's an interesting thing. And what all modes of program delivery we have? Do we have please any? Please stick to one delivery? point. I would request so that everybody gets a okay. chance to speak. So please give one point so that everybody can add one point. And also, if some point is covered, so that you need not repeat that point. Thank you. Yes, Doctor Amrit. I think you have the point to make. Just one point, please. uh objective uh, sorry execution that comes in the end that's it i mean yeah, and execution is one 
yeah ha material people and tool i okay. mean whatever is required for it work on those three and things then the broad category yeah, yeah. but uh, payal you have something to say go ahead please yeah yeah so understand the setup and point out the target population and list out the challenges individually are facing okay so understanding the challenges that you need to address okay thank you so much yes dr kundan you have point to me go ahead designing uh, the program that the audience will be also be interactive Okay, so make sure that your audience enjoys your session. Yes. Excellent, very good. Yes, Doctor Neha, you have a point to make. Handouts, Madam. Uh, wow. The material handouts were before, and that is yes. very important. Some study material. Yes, wonderful. Okay. Material. Thank you. Yes, Doctor Aparna, you have a point to make. Please go ahead. I think I think the only change I would say is I would first change myself and the way I communicate because the areas where I am lacking, I have to become. Uh, at least I, I will not be perfect, but at least little closer to a little better version of mine for me to give sessions to others. I think that's a very good point. So working your on yourself as a trainer is very important. Upskilling yourself is very important. Thank you for adding that point. Yes, Neha, you you have raised your hand. But uh, the, the actual PPT is the actual role plays. The actual pedagogy is working on them. Excellent. So be clear about what pedagogies you are going to use in the program. How are you going to make it very engaging? Yes. Santoshi, do you have any new point to add? You yes, and, yes. And before starting a program, we need to have a proper uh, training schedule along with the objective that how we are going to meet those objectives at the end of the program, including all the things which we have just uh, said, all of us have said. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Neha, any, any additional point you want to yes. talk about? Go ahead, yes, madam. We need to know. Yes, our faculty also. That is very oh. important. I mean, okay. who are the faculty is going to be? So excellent. that is um, excellent. If, if yeah. I may, can say something more. Otherwise, one more point. If go ahead. I think there are no more hands, so you can you can take the liberty of the second point also. So the feedback. designing a feedback form which we are doing every day with you also i mean so i mean what improvements can be brought or how was the program the feedback so that is very, also very thank you important. thank you that's very important mamta i think you have another point to add is it yeah ma'am yeah. yes ma'am yeah. learning outcomes are very important ma'am what we prepare wonderful thank you thank you so many hands are coming yes. up so the you the other one is ma'am distributing uh, your entire program in number of hours The, it is very so important. Now we are going into the finer details, but I am very glad that you all have started thinking that designing program is not like you just plan something and yeah. go and talk and execute the program, and it has no beginning, no end, no reason, no purpose, no outcome, no assessment. I think I am glad that all of you are bringing up so many points. The whole idea of this brainstorming small activity was to to do things in a planned manner. there's a very beautiful yeah. saying called if you fail to plan you have planned plan. i repeat if you fail to plan you have planned to fail so doing anything in a haphazard manner not in a planned manner may land you up in success or may not give you the desired success so even for the program that i'm running for the 10th batch every time i do a session i go through all my slides once again i see what more can be added i see how the order can be changed i see what different ways i can bring in and now i am making it more and more you know participatory i am asking you these questions and you have covered almost everything that is there on my slides imagine my task has become easier i don't have to explain i will be just rushing through the ppt in 15 minutes and everything will be covered that's the beauty of having so many people to share their learning that's how when you are conducting a training program see how you can make it engaging how you can make it participatory so people when they say that online programs are not interesting they are not engaging they don't you know get good response and feedback from people very honestly with all gratitude to almighty i think it has been a wonderful experience for me through and through and i'm sure you will agree with me looking at your participation you will agree with me so i can see couple of more hand but i'm not going to ask you to i think yeah <laughs> i think budget and convincing the management 
and coordinating how when the nurses will come that is a big challenge i know i know so all that maybe i'm not actually talking about when i say designing a successful program i basically want to focus in your own capacity what points you should keep in mind so that there is no step missed which can affect the outcome so very quickly i'm delivery going to tools delivery, delivery tools. tools also absolutely the even pedagogy. internet which is the biggest yeah. okay. absolutely so so all those things i think some of you have covered internet nobody covered i think dr amrit covered thank you so much so i'm just going to rush through the presentation because we have covered almost everything rather i would say you have added more points than i have in my list so you will find my presentation you know uh, you know uh, less than the uh, ideas that you have shared with me let me quickly share the you know presentation with you now we have discussed how do you design your program and we you all came up with excellent ideas and thoughts to share with the step one that i would recommend is please find out the training needs how do we normally find out the training needs write in the chat box how do how do we find out the training needs write in the chat box quickly i'm waiting to see your answers in the chat box okay so we ask what problem staff have faced feedback forms can give us an idea about the training needs okay mm -hmm. by knowing the problem areas okay if we are there in the system you will know too many complaints absolutely if you are getting lot of complaints about one situation or a staff then you know that we there is a you know training need gap analysis yes deepika i, I agree with you santoshi says we circulate training need assessment tool in the form of assessment as that participants want to go learn yes that's a wonderful idea uh, wonderful feedback from staff doctors incidents that indicate that there is a need for training Aditi says, "Talk to the staff regarding what are the problems they are facing." Yes, that also gives you an idea about what uh, is the training need. Feedback is another area. If you take your patients' feedback seriously, trust me, that is the best tool to, you know, bring change and improvement in your way of functioning. Normally, we do not take feedback very seriously. When you all give your feedback, sometimes I am not able to go through it immediately, but I don't close that window. that window gets closed only if i have gone through feedback of each and every respondent right from one to the last one and i go up to the last point and even in that i am making changes if i want to know more about something then i bring that question in the feedback form so that i can get feedback that can help me improve the performance similarly your patient feedback when they give you you have a very fair idea about how are patients feeling if they are your best critique they are your best critique and you cannot get better you know idea about what you need to do so timely refresher programs and assessing pre during employment training yes that i agree then observation during assessment yes that also give an idea audience programs for seasoned professionals yeah so that means we 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 need to keep an eye on what is the need of the r and we need to really keep upgrading ourselves so like uh, Uh, santoshi has mentioned about a training need assessment i don't know how many of you are really using any training need assessment tool but that's a wonderful way to you know do it some of the simpler ways that i can suggest you is for example uh, on site observation if you go yourself and see quietly uh, as a patient you will get an idea what your patient must be experiencing or needing you could ask the management what do they think what are the challenges so like for example just uh, yesterday i received a phone call from somebody they said that we want you to do a pre pro training program for our staff uh, they are into you know uh, exhibition medical exhibition they say we have lot of inquiries coming up and we have we have limited uh, you know space so we have around 1000 people who want to you know get an entry into our exhibition but we have space for only 500 to 600 people but our staff does not know how to you know res respectfully refuse them so that's the complaint that the management has brought up now i know that this is the training need of course i'll be doing my further you know uh, homework to understand what more needs to be added but if you ask the management you know what what is the challenge they are facing if you ask the participants and, and employees they would come up with what they think they would like to you know upskill it could be their skill or a knowledge or uh, some learning 
So tools like you know knowledge assessment, skill assessment can help you know the the gap. Uh, patient feedback, as all of you have mentioned, is a very good tool to know what we need to you know integrate in our training programs. Complaints and suggestions also help you to you know, know uh, what is the uh, weak area or where we need to improve. One of the very good ways you know corporate sector uses. I don't know in healthcare whether we are using or not, and that is called. Uh, mystery customers. So mystery customers are where, you know, somebody poses as a uh, patient or patient family member and then they talk to the hospital staff and they give you a feedback. Uh, has anybody used this or is anybody using this something like this? Yes, madam. It has been used in my setup a few times. Okay. 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 Wonderful. So you have a personal experience of knowing uh, what the patient feels or what you actually go through. Now, once you have done your training need assessment, you know that this is what I you know, need to be addressed. Depending upon that, now very realistically develop the training objectives. Because training objectives sometimes uh, have to be very, you know, well thought and realistic. A lot of time when I did two hours program and if somebody said, ma'am, change the YNA. So two hours program cannot change 20 years old pro, uh, behavior. So don't have unrealistic objectives which will be overwhelming and give you a feeling that I have failed in my duty. So objective could be creating awareness. It could be sensitizing people. It could be imparting new skills and knowledge. It could be just to bring a change in the attitude. It could be promotion and growth in their working. Or it could be aligning the employees to the vision and mission of the organization. For example, induction program that you have, usually you want people to know what we are working towards and how they are supposed to align themselves. A lot of programs are about skill building. So you know why I need to really integrate that. Or it could be even behavior modification. So depending upon the objective, you will have to design a program because if you are looking for behavior modification or skill building, then definitely it requires more time and more learning. So it can't be done in one or two hours. A lot of time I get this, you know, invite from people, that we have three session hai, ye char topics cover kar ek program mein chart chart topics sab cover kar lijiye i mean practically that's not something that's possible so you very realistically you have to develop your training objectives so once you have your clarity on what your training objectives are the next step is brainstorming so when i say brainstorming uh, people who are you know seasoned trainer who are already in training i'm sure the moment you will have a topic or title in front of you okay i have to talk on uh, conflict resolution. So you will know what all you can cover under this topic. You can, you know, write your points, you can write your pedagogies, you can bring in activities, you can bring in content, everything will come. So normally for this, what I do, I use a very interesting tool called eDraw Mind Master. So how many of you have uh, heard about eDraw Mind Master? Has anybody heard about eDraw Mind Master? No. So let me show you a uh, uh, you know, a sample of it. It's a both free and uh, uh, paid version. I'm not using paid version. I'm using a free version of it. Am I sharing this screen? No, let me share this screen. Okay. Uh, there it is. So this is, you can make a note of it. It's a very interesting and useful tool. You will find it very useful. So it's, uh, it's, let me reduce this size so that you can see. So eDraw Mind Master is more like, you know, it's one whiteboard in front of you uh, where you are just writing whatever thoughts you are having. So when you write on the whiteboard, the problem is after a while you will have to uh, work on another project. So now whatever you have written has to be, you know, wiped off. But this is like, this is there with you for whatever time you want to keep. So what I normally do, whatever thoughts that come to my mind, I'm just going to increase the size, yeah. So whatever thoughts that come to your mind, you keep writing in a random manner. So maybe I'll show you another, uh, this thing, yeah. So whatever thoughts come to you, so these are floating ideas. I will just create floating ideas, uh, like for example, uh, let me show you a sample of, yeah. So I would just write floating idea. So this is floating idea, not yet in order. I will just put everything on the whiteboard. And then at a point, I will just bring them in an order like this. 
where also this is what I'm going to do first, this is what I'm going to do later, this is the activity I'm going to use, this much is the time I'm going to spend on each activity. So this gives you a very, you know, very clear bird's eye view, how you are going to run the show. You could add anything. You could talk about pedagogies, time, audience, whatever you want to talk about. So this is one tool that I use and you can actually, you know, uh, uh, develop, uh, you could you actually download this tool and uh, write down your points in it. And I find it very helpful. There is a paid version also, but I'm not using that one. This is more than enough for all of us. E-Draw Mind Master. But those are first... Ma'am, what was that MA so I am working with Malanas at Medical College. I am working with the medical students, final year medical students. So before they go for their internship, they have to undergo six day six hours training with me, and I do the uh, you know uh, training in batches of thirty students at a time, and they learn how do you go about you know conducting patient interview and also uh, you know how to handle situations where you have to break bad news or you have to you know handle aggressive patient party. So all that I do in that six hours. So this is the plan of action that I normally adopt in my program. So you can you can actually, but those of you who are still uh, you know not very used to conducting training program, I would suggest do little R and D. You will find a lot of material on Google. Go through that material and then you design your own plan how you want to do it. That's one reason why I never give these slides to my participants. Although you have access to it at YouTube, but I non normally never give the uh, you know presentation as it is because i want you to create your own set of material when you create you know under this one line what all you want to talk or what is there in your mind or in your heart therefore one thing that i'll advise never copy paste anybody's content you can have a look you can learn from it but build your own now after you have everything you know uh, on your whiteboard now you create a flow in the content. What will go in the beginning? What will be the body of your session? How are you going to end? And what is going to be the takeaway? So now you have clarity. Okay, I'm going to start like this. This is what I'm going to talk in the battery body. This is how I'm going to end it. And that, that is what is my takeaway to my audience. Once you have these things clear, now next step is developing your training pedagogies. So what different pedagogies of presentation are you currently using, if I may ask you? Write in the chat box. Write in the chat box, what different pedagogies are you using as of now? PPT, role plays, yes, I think very common. PPT is very common, I agree. Posters, very good. Role play, demonstrator, mannequin, and PPT. Yes, wonderful. Simulation, I think, helps uh, when you use mannequin. Absolutely. How about others? Videos, role plays, PPT. Yes. Live sessions. Yes. But in the live sessions also, you need to use some activities like, like role plays or discussion or group activities. Case scenario, yes, that's a very good way of um, pictures and books. Yes, that's another good way of, you know, uh, conducting or uh, using different pedagogies. Quiz, yes, very, very good. Quiz, rapid fire round, that they're very energetic. They are very engaging. Uh, scenario based discussion, yes, very good. Uh, PPT videos, role plays, demonstration, re-demonstration, flip charts, similarities, uh, simulating case scenarios. Absolutely. Polls, yes, that's also polls also is a good. Yes, case scenario and quiz, audio, video, story, role play. Wonderful. So that means we are already using a lot of things, using recordings of board incident. Yes. So using some ways that, that actually kind of validates what you are saying. So it could be anything like you have already mentioned, role play, question, questionnaires, and then experience sharing, storytelling, rapid fire round, puzzles, group activities, videos, anything. It's very important to integrate these activities in an interesting and engaging way with the flow of your content. So you may have a bucket of pedagogies. Think what will fit in where. And then, you know, know that this is what I'm going to do here and this is what I'm going to do. Now, once you have this thing ready, next step is to... Yes, please. Yeah. 
Yeah, ma'am, I have one doubt here. Uh, now we are taking it as a virtual learning. So in during virtual learning, uh, is it possible? I mean, time would not be uh, enough for us to involve all the candidates in storytelling in in the other activities. So how, ma'am? What so are the best ways? We use different strategies. In one, you use everyone. In some, you give chance to a couple of people. Then you remember, okay, these people are not participating. I have to give chance to them. So you use different pedagogy so that you know you are engaging everybody. So even you can see in the online program that we are running right now, I'm trying to engage everybody, give a chance to everybody to speak so that nobody feels that, oh, I am not included or I my views are not you know, taken seriously. So that's how you have to be mindful. Therefore, no, normally in online program, of course, that discussion will happen either today or in the next session. We are on in the online program. I always say don't have more than 20 people in online because in, in a screen, you can't see more than 25 people. But you can't interact with all 25. In number of my batches, I've had 20 and more than 20 participants. It becomes exhausting to engage everybody. So I would say limit your audience to not more than 20. 20 is maximum. That you can manage. But if you go beyond 20, then at times it becomes very exhausting and very difficult to handle. But definitely... Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, but you have to be really pro, you know... Uh, doing online program because most of the times I feel people are not able to engage their audience and that's why they uh, the audience also feel that they, they have not been able to you know enjoy the program. Yes, Dr. Manisha, I think you have a question. Go ahead, please. No, no, ma'am. I just wanted to see the previous slide to know from you that which pedagogies you have been using. Although we have put in the chat box, just mm -hmm. wanted to see uh, that. Which almost different... everything, almost everything we have we are using. Almost everything. Group activities you have been doing, storytelling you yeah. have been doing, role plays we are doing, rapid fire round we are doing and we will be doing also. In every session you will see I will be using some interesting you know, tool to make it interesting. Videos we have seen already. Questionnaires I will be giving you a couple of questionnaires to work on. So I think experience sharing I always ask you to share your experience. That's how you know you are always on the go. Nobody is able to you know get distracted and go out. Therefore, I always say, have your video on. If your, your video is on, you cannot lose contact with me. You don't, you, you will automatically get engaged with me. Yes, ma'am. Then that is very correct. Because then yeah. you are present there. If your yeah, videos absolutely. is off, you are not present actually. There's a risk of a distraction. Yeah. Dr. Amrit, you have anything to say? You, you have raised your hand? Or it was last time when you raised? Okay. Okay. So what I'm trying to say here is that once you have, you know, uh, these uh, activities in place, now is the time to develop the course material. So with a small program, maybe you would like to give a small handout. If it's a big program, then it's a good idea to give some handbook so that people can read and go through the content and, you know, uh, have a look at the material because later on also it's important for them to revise. Uh, so if you allow them to, you know, read that if you give them some handbook they will they will be able to revisit the content and also use it in their future learning very rightly said by dr neha once you have you know everything ready don't forget to have pre test post test and feedback these are very important tools that will help you in knowing what change have you been able to bring in their knowledge or in their attitude or in their understanding or it could be even you know their confidence and subject knowledge. Feedback is a very good way. I always say, take your you know, audience feedback very, very seriously. Once you have everything ready, go ahead and execute the training. Execution part we'll be covering in the next session. Uh, once you have done it, take feedback and keep the feedback form simple to the point and anonymous. So you may be wondering that, how come here I am asking you to give your name and I'm otherwise recommending to keep your, you know, feedback anonymous. When you are taking anonymous, I mean, you are, you're taking feedback from people who are, you know, uh, different positioned in hierarchy. So if you ask them to give their name, they will hesitate to give an honest feedback. But here I consider all of you equal. So I believe your feedback, if you are able to give in an honest manner, I can always get back and ask you for more clarification and understanding so that we can make it better. 
And that's why I ask you to, you know, write your name. So just yesterday, I started another batch of, you know, IMA Kerala. So one of the participants had rated everything as one, two, one, two. Whereas everybody else gave five uh, in the rating. I said either probably she did not like anything that I spoke or there is some confusion. So I just messaged her and I said that I always read my participants feedback very carefully and I've seen that you have given one and two. So did you really find something wrong with the session or there is some misunderstanding? And she said, according to me, one was the best. So I thought I gave you the best feedback. So, so when you have, you know, name of the person, you can get back the person and take the feedback. But as I said uh, earlier also, I read every person's feedback very, very carefully. And I try to, so one of, some of you have written, we need more sessions. I, I have read that. I have read that. And I know we are all getting distracted because you're all discussing so valuable points that at times we lose contact with the, the time and we, we give going flow. Uh, uh, I don't know how will I, we have more sessions, but right now we all know that we have to restrict it to 10 topics so that at least some baseline is ready. So maybe tomorrow when we have, you know, uh, advanced program, so we'll have some more topics covered in that session. After the training, sit and reflect your training. If you reflect on your training, very honestly, trust me, you will know what, uh, you, you know, uh, where you went wrong, what you did not do correct, what you need to change, because that's memory is fresh. So don't wait for two, three days. I would say as early as possible, sit and go through your slides once again. Sit and go through what you did. We forget 80% of what we do within 24 hours. If I ask you, uh, what breakfast did you take yesterday? Honestly, you will take a couple of seconds to recollect what was my breakfast. So as early as possible, sit with yourself, reflect, go back to the comments, go back to the uh, verbal responses of people, try to, uh, you know, recollect everything. You'll get a lot of, you know, input from that. So when you're designing a program, some of the things that you need to consider, I'm going to quickly rush through it. One is board of training. You have already pointed out if it's an online program, then it is different. For online, as I said, don't go for more than 20 people. On-site program, again, if it's a hands-on training, I, I always say do not have more than 30 people. If it is more than 30, it's going to be a seminar. It cannot be hands-on. Mostly, we like to give hands-on training because we want people to go back with you know, deeper understanding, some experiential learning. So it will be difficult for you to engage if you have 50 people. You can't every, give everybody a chance to do role play. So mode of training will decide everything, actually, very honestly. You have to keep an eye on the audience size also. So this is one program I did at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Hospital. So you can see the, the whole the, uh, their lecture theater or whatever you call it, conference room was full with people. And it couldn't have been more than, you know, a, a, a seminar. A lot of time, you will have very few people in the audience. So you will have to keep that in mind because if the audience is small, you can plan, you know, activities to engage everyone. If the audience is very small, very big, then probably you'll have to design your activity. Suppose, for example, in this activity, in this uh, session, if I asked everybody to give their introduction, then I think the whole time would have gone just getting the introduction from everyone. So you'll have to really plan your activities accordingly, depending upon the size of the audience that you have. Now, how important it is to know your audience? And why Very is it important? important? Because the way we talk, the language we use, the issues which we discuss, mm -hmm. uh, the level, if it is uh, if already there, they don't know basics, there's no point talking about the things. Absolutely. It's like that. Yeah. And what all should you do? Yes, ma'am. What all subjects you... should be planned accordingly? Yeah. Because but what uh, you do uh, what you're asking you to experience people in our group, mm -hmm. then objectives um, maybe for the same topic, like for example, if I take a first step, just an example. So yeah. maybe if experienced people are there, I can have uh, a different methodologies, uh, different pre-test, post-test. But if the audience is participating for the first time, 
Mm-hmm. Now the assessment part, the methodologies that I'll be using, mm-hmm. that will be different. So the course objective depends upon who is my... So we lost your voice, Santoshi. We lost your voice, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. I got your point. Yeah, ma'am. I got your point. Thank you so much. So they're going to add, ma'am. One second. So if you remember, I sent you the brief introduction of the participant and there were a couple of questions. The idea of giving that form to all of you was to know you so that I know what is your expectation. What is your baseline? How many years of experience you have? How many years of training experience you have? So that will give me an idea about my audience and then I can better prepare myself for the for the situation. Somebody wanted to say a point. Go ahead, please. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah hold on. I think somebody wants to make a point. Yeah, and sure, sure. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The audience should be related to the program. Then only it will be helpful for them and also uh, to the one, the, to the trainer to explain very well. Otherwise, it will be a difficult for the trainer to explain them in detail. Yeah, I agree. But normally we consider that if we are planning a program, it's for a specific audience. But yes, I agree with you that you should know that which who is your audience and they should be related to the topic. Yes, uh, Sneha, what is the point that you wish to make? Uh, my question is, uh, often uh, the trainings which I do... Uh... There's a lot of unlearning to do for seasoned uh, professionals. Uh, so they have to change their practices. Some behavior change has to happen. For that, I usually use uh, case scenarios and uh, what experiences they had and why, what went wrong. But then I feel there's some something more I'm missing. I mean, can you talk about what pe- uh, pedagogies or strategies would work with unlearning rather than, you know, changing their mindsets rather than uh, so, freshers? So- it's easier to train postgraduates and freshers. So a lot of time, you know, uh, consequences of their actions, if you can, you know, bring up in in an emotional way. Okay. They will realize, okay, I don't do this and this can end up into this. And also Uh, that point I'm going to cover in the next thing, that is if you can integrate what is in it for me. What is Mm. in it for me? That's very important if you are looking for behavior modification. So when we go for assessment, I'm sure those of you who are into assessment, we see the the housekeeping staff is not using the the heavy duty gloves or the shoes they are supposed to be wearing when you are they are handling biomedical waste. And if even if they are wearing in front of us, we can make out looking at the shoes that these are new shoes and they don't look like used shoes. So that means they are just wearing for the purpose of assessment. But if you can help them understand why using heavy duty gloves, how it will help you and protect you. And also why should they be wearing those heavy duty shoes to protect them from biomedical you know, injury. If you are able to help them see that, you will see they'll be more willing to change. Behavior modification is the most difficult task. So you have to actually yeah. address it from various points of view. Another important uh, thing, What I see is... Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, please go on. Another important thing in behavior modification, especially with the adult audience, let me tell you, you cannot change people's behavior directly. Mm-hmm. One, being a good role model mm-hmm. and using a positive reinforcement technique can help you help them change their behavior. There's a very beautiful book called One Minute Manager. Okay. It's a very uh, small 60-70% pages book. I think I have a PDF I'll share in the group. This book talks about how do you go about you know aligning people with you. People will change hmm. if they want to change. People will change if they are able to see that you are their well wisher People will go extra mile to agree with you because they know you you connect well with them. So how do you really align with, align them with you? Very beautifully explained in that book. I'll share that book with you. It's written by an excellent, uh, very well-known uh, author. Uh, I think it's uh, Hershey Blanchard, if I'm not wrong. So it's a beautiful book. I'll share the PDF with you. So these are different tools that will help you, you know, create a culture of behavior modification. Appreciating people applauding people whenever they do something good 
is a wonderful way to and in case if they are not doing if they are not following rather than criticizing or condemning publicly talk to them one on one separately let them know that this is not appropriate you are setting a wrong precedence if you do this others will not agree so please you have to fall in line but at the same time we all need to be good role models and actually practice irrespective of the fact whether somebody is watching me or not then you can expect people changing themselves so uh, uh going back to the I, uh, yeah okay okay let's talk later then yeah so, that's what i'm saying because then we will be going beyond. yeah yeah it's okay yeah Quickly, sure. I'm trying to you know uh, cover. But most of the points have been covered by you, so therefore I'm not spending much time on it. So if you know your audience, who they are, what is their age group, what is their pro profession, what is their position in the system, how many years of experience they have, you will know what uh, what and how I have to deliver to them. So uh, another important point: how willing is the audience? I think we all know when the audience is not willing, not interesting, it becomes very difficult to you know uh, engage them. A lot of time in the program has been arranged by management, and the audience have been asked to just come and sit. It becomes very challenging. So their creating interest and motivating them also will be an additional responsibility on you if you want your program to go successfully. A very important point to consider is how much is the allotted time. You may be asked to speak for five minutes. or you may be asked to do a training for 5 hours and are you able to you know put your message in those 5 minutes to 5 hours again that's an art that comes with lot of practice lot of learning but it's very important to learn to cover whatever content you want to give so that means meticulous planning in terms of time that you are going to spend on each uh, you know topic or each sub topic has to be very well thought couple of things which you should make sure that they are working and in place sitting arrangement always preferably have a, a round table or a square table with people sitting around it rather than people sitting in a webinar room or a seminar room uh, but i know there are places you can't change the sitting room so you'll have to go ahead with whatever is available making sure that the projector mic audio system everything is working and functional just having is not enough don't hesitate going and checking once again if it is working a lot of time when i go to a place for doing a program they say hey ma'am and when they go and try to start ma'am ye to kaam nahi kar raha and then so before hand make sure give somebody a responsibility to go and check if it is working i normally would have a wall clock facing me especially if it's a full day program i'll keep a wall clock in, because you have lot of content to share and you have to go by the time so you really need to regulate your content to meet the time limit so having a wall clock is a good idea uh, full name in capitals sorry not full name first name in capitals to the uh, you know size that it is readable from a distance of say around 10 feet is a very good idea if you can ask people to have stickies put on their left or right shoulder with their first name especially if you are going to meet them for the whole day and you need to know their name because the moment you will call them by name they will get connected with you it's a very helpful way to engage your audience stationery for example pen copy some activities or if you are using planning to do some activities props for the activities all that should be you know there make sure that it is already arranged things like water facility restroom i think we we all know to to run a successful program as i said earlier also please make sure that you start with what is in it for me if you can showcase them how are they going to be benefited by attending it trust me they will be going with you a uh, beginning and end of course should be very well thought with a very clear carry home message because that's what is going to ultimately go with them we all know recency effect we remember what you know what we ended with so make sure there is a very clear carry home message again with adult audience you cannot teach them anything but you can ask thought provoking questions and get them into thinking mode experience has long lasting impact content actually has very limited value so create like for example this activity on chinese whisper that we did i think you'll remember all your life that okay we all being in spite of you know doctors we messed up with the information so you will you will know that this can be a big uh, you know challenge so create as many experiences as possible 
Even studies have shown that when you integrate audio, visual, kinesthetic learning, there is more part of the brain that gets involved and engaged in the activity. So make sure that you have, and we are going to cover this in session four also, and you will also get to know your own learning style. What is your dominant learning style in the next session? So, but in general, I think when you are planning a training, you can't go and check their learning style beforehand. So best will be to integrate as many learning styles as possible so that everybody gets ultimately engaged. So use a lot of training, you know, pedagogies that can engage them. Whatever you say, make sure that you support it with some statement and studies and report. I find when I share source of the statement, when I share the report of the state, uh, any, you know, study that I share, people feel very satisfied. They suddenly have that trust that I'm not talking on my behalf. I'm talking on the behalf of the researched studies that the, the people have shared. Another important thing that I want to tell you is please keep updating your knowledge and skill. If you are not doing it, you're going to be obsolete very soon. Your audience should have this belief that you know your subject very well. And it's not just the subject. You should know much more than much. Like, for example, uh, Sneha, you just now asked me about behavior modification. If I have some answer to give you, if I can give you some examples, you will immediately have this trust. Okay, my trainer knows about uh, how do you go about behavior modification. Of course, we are all human beings. I'm not saying that we need to have an answer for every question. But I could also say, I'm sorry, I don't know this, but I can find out for you and get back to you. That's also, but I can't do this very often. Maybe once in a while you can take this stand or maybe you don't want to answer that and you can park that question. But in general, I think being ready with answers and some explanation, which is making sense, not like any silly explanation, helps you to you know, uh, demonstrate that you know your subject very well. Regularly time your session. I'm talking to you, I have an eye on the watch. I know we have past 10 minutes. Uh, and I'm sure all of you must be doing that. It is 10, 10 already in your watch. So you have to be really very, you know, realistic in uh, planning how much you can really cover. Trust me, you will be able to actually deliver much less than what you plan, especially if you have an audience who is very interested and very engaged. There probably you will, you will really fall short of time. But all that you balancing that you will learn, uh, Again, I have re-emphasized, re please read back, feedback carefully. That's what is going to help you to improve yourself and make it a habit to reflect on every performance. The more you practice, the more you done. So have you heard this concept of 10,000 hours? Have you heard of this concept of 10,000 hours? Yeah. It was from you, I think, in the last class. Yes, I discussed it. Yeah. Thank you for remembering. Yeah. So studies for have mastery. Shown, mm. Yeah. To be subject expert, spend 10,000 hours and you will be subject expert. So more you will invest in terms of your time and energy, more you will have control on the content and the delivery. So this is in nutshell about how do you go about designing a program. Next session will be how do you facilitate the program and how do you handle disruptive audience and different situations. I know we are 10 minutes past. Any question, any clarification, a very short one if you have, we can take up. And I'm going to give you the link for feedback form. Before we close, I want you to give your feedback. Yes, Neha, I think you wish to say something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if other people can want to leave, then... This has been a very important uh, thing for me. Though. So I, I am again bringing it up for, uh, you know, audience who are seasoned, uh, who are already working. They mm -hmm. often don't have the self-awareness that they're doing something wrong. So when we start for behavioral modification, they think what you're saying, I'm already doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm actually doing a good job supporting my patients. Mm -hmm. So you know, especially when you're an outsider, you you don't belong to that uh, uh, hospital, it becomes really difficult to um, bring them that awareness that what, and, and they have this mental block ki, I'm anyway good yeah. at this. I'm very good at example. I'm very good at So, this, this incident my husband shared with me almost 30 years ago. 30 years, maybe more than 30 years. 35 years ago. Till date, I have not forgotten. And I always value this learning for me. 
So he said there was a, um, you know, associate, uh, assist, assist, associate professor who joined his department. As I said, he's an ophthalmologist. So uh, uh, postgraduate from All India Medical Institute, Delhi, uh, passed out from uh, Ames and then did her FRCS after her post-graduation. She came from UK after her FRCS and then she joined this hospital, uh, medical college and hospital as associate professor. So my husband one day came back and told me, and there were a lot of professors, very senior, senior people. And you know, we have challenged with senior people. Sometimes they're very, you know, old school thought. He came and told me that some I'll say in Hindi first and then I explain it. Kuch log dusro par bhari pad jate hain aur kuch log dusro ko halka mehsoos karwa dete hain. So, what you are saying, this is going to be discussed at length in the next session. But rather than entangling with them and wasting your time and energy in proving that I know my subject well and you don't know and still you are barging in. Sometimes through your good behavior, through your subject knowledge, you can make people know that you have a lot of experience, but I am subject expert. But for that, you really need to be thorough with your work. Your commitment and mm -hmm. passion should be flowing through you. Okay. True. And as I, I think I shared with you that I did 500 programs for Delhi government hospitals and a couple of hospitals. I had a huge challenge. Uh, it was resident welfare association members who came and literally hijacked my session. I went home and I was boggled. I said, what is this? What has happened with me? I said, this can't be happening to me. I have to learn how to handle that situation. In those days, I spent 45,000 rupees to attend a three days program by Dale Carnegie. Now they have five days program and I think they are charging anything like 75,000 rupees. I learned how to handle difficult situations. I learned how to handle destructive people. All that I'm going to share with you in the next session. So save your questions okay. for that and all others also, whatever questions you have, save your questions and we will definitely take up these situations. I'll be more than happy to you know, take up those situations and give you my thoughts on how you can you know, uh, handle those situations. Of course, there's no one line answer, but definitely give you some food for thought and be ready for the next situation. So I've shared the link for the feedback form. I've already received four responses. I request all other to complete the feedback form and then we close the session. And whatever questions you have regarding facilitation, please keep them ready. In the next session, we are going to talk about them. So next session will be when I will be in India. I think it's it will be on the 3rd, I believe. Yeah, 3rd of May. Uh, one quick uh, point. Dr. Manisha has asked for change in the date because probably from 5th to 9th, she is not there. Very honestly, I don't know if, uh, if it suits everybody. But if you want, then... It has to be in the next week and not the same uh, week because as it is, I will be traveling back and I'll be very occupied, but I didn't want to change the date. So I said, let's continue with third. Unless I lose my voice, then I will request you to pardon me for that and we'll have to re, re I mean, plan. But otherwise, third is sure. We are going to meet on third from 8 to 10 p.m. But if everybody is okay with changing the date, we can consider any date in the next week, keeping the, in mind my availability on that date. I think I'm traveling in that week for two days to Udaipur for a training program. And then I have a session with the AI, IMA Kerala branch. So these three days probably I'll be occupied. And one program I already have with you. But whatever it is, I think we need to discuss. One more point. Books have been dispatched. Some of you have received, I think. Dr. Manisha said that she has received. Have others also received? I think very soon you will get it. I requested the publisher that please oblige us by sending the book to all my participants. This is the bus first batch where I'm trying to you know, improvise in this manner that you get a copy of it. With a humble request that read any one chapter that you, you want to read 
and give your reviews, honest reviews. I'm not asking for any favor in that, but give your reviews in the on Amazon so that people know about the book. When they read reviews, they they find it useful. I spent two years and I also got writer's cramp because of writing. So I think I can ask this much of help from all of you. So very soon, I think you will get a copy of the book in a day or two. Dr. Manisha has received. I'm surprised. How come Dr. Manisha received it? Because um, maybe you are in Delhi, so maybe that's why you got it. Good call. Okay, so, so I've received I nine responses. Yeah, somebody was saying something, please. Yeah. So finally, when is the next session? Third, we are meeting. Next Third. session. Third. I'm I'm reaching on second. Hopefully everything will be fine. I will not have any challenge with internet and my throat. These two things are my concern. If everything is okay, then we are definitely meeting on third. Thank you so much. All of you have been wonderful audience. I thoroughly enjoyed interacting with each one of you. You all are really very passionate about this and I'm very happy that you are there with me in this program. And you could also share your thoughts on LinkedIn. I don't know how many of you are on LinkedIn. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful idea to write your experiences and whatever you are learning on LinkedIn because you never know it can take you places. I got an opportunity to travel to Ohio. Everything paid. Just because I post my work on LinkedIn. Somebody from Cleveland Clinic uh, approached me that we are very impressed with the kind of work you are doing and we want you to come and attend our annual meet on patient experience. So they looked after everything. So you must post your work on LinkedIn because LinkedIn is a very professional place. People don't post their personal life and useless thing. It's all about what we are doing and learning from each other. So you must post uh, some pictures or some whatever you are learning because you want to popularize yourself as a trainer in the time to come. Okay, so I have 10 responses. I think uh, anybody who's left? Dr. Manisha, I think you are still left. Unmute your device, I think. Yeah. Ma'am, I'm doing, I started late. I'm so sorry. And I've okay. received the book. It's beautiful. I'll start reading. Thank you so much, ma'am. Sure. Uh, I, that's why I'm not asking read the whole book and then give your reviews. Maybe one chapter if you can read. Yes, definitely, ma'am. So I'll start reading it uh, tomorrow and then I'll definitely post as you have asked and share the feedback in the group also. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. So, uh, Dr. Manisha, you can quickly complete the feedback form and then we close this session because, or, or otherwise those who have done, they can leave. I know it's not good to hold you uh, so late. You can all leave. Uh, I'll let it be on till Dr. Manisha completes you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Good night. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much, Deepika. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neha. Thank you.